Hey guys, it's Emma Vigling with TYT Politics. I am back to give you another story that I found pretty interesting. By the way, quick plug, go ch check out uh, Jordan's videos in for Standing Rock. I know they've been all over, but um, unlike the rest of the media, J Jordan has been there and had, had the cameras there since the beginning. We've been there five times, so go check out all those videos. And a lot of you guys have asked um, how you can donate to TYT Politics and how we can expand, how we can get more people, how I don't have to be out of my dad's office uh at his home office to give you guys the the news so um go to tytnetwork.com slash go that's how you can donate that's how we can expand to tyt politics and that's how jordan can get some help up at standing rock everything like that so don't forget to go to tytnetwork.com slash go so I wanted to give you guys uh, my thoughts on this kind of interesting Washington Post editorial, which was entitled, Could the Congressional Obstruction at Any Cost Playbook Work for Democrats? So there's been a lot of discussion about how we're going to obstruct Trump, how we're going to make sure that Trump doesn't do the things that he said in his platform. A lot of the racist things are the ones that are getting attention, but I'm very concerned as well at, with the tax plan, with Chuck Schumer being the head of, of the party in the Senate. Um, that means that he's going to want to get down to business and do tax cuts with the Republicans. Chuck Schumer is a notorious corporatist. So I obviously, as a progressive, and I think a lot of progressives, want to see the Democratic Party be more obstructionist, be more like the Tea Party in, to, in the 2010s. Because honestly, the, the Republicans just want to slash everything that would make American, like give a safety net to poorer Americans, they want to cut taxes on corporations, everything that would kind of harm Americans in the process. So I, I, I see no problem with throwing the game back in the Republicans' face. But this Washington Post article, while not nefarious, totally misses the point for me, and I want to give you guys my analysis of it, because they still pretend like it's politics as usual, even though we just had a moron, orange moron, reality show host, who participated in WWE, elected to president. <laughs> so they still want to pretend like it's politics as usual, and pretend like it's, oh, it's a polling game, it's a, it's a messaging game. So... This editorial begins. The night Barack Obama was inaugurated in 2009, a number of Republican leaders met for dinner in Washington. Their goal was fairly simple. Figure out how to best deal with this political neophyte who'd swept into office by popular acclaim, a new president who could work with Democratic majorities on both sides of the Hill. The consensus was elegant in its simplicity. Republicans would fight Obama on nearly everything, betting that this obstructionism would be rewarded. The single most important thing we want to achieve is for President Obama to be a one-term president, now Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell famously said, which is similar to what a lot of Democrats are saying now about Donald Trump. That didn't work, but everything else did. Republicans retook the House in 2010 and held it through the next three elections. The Democrats were obliterated at every level of government, and last month, in part of the strength of skepticism about the ability of the government to solve problems, they retook the... White House. McConnell, <clears throat> McConnell achieved limiting the Democrats to two terms of the presidency. Close enough. It's now the Democrats who find themselves in the position of having to figure out how to deal with the oppositional dominance. Quite naturally, the question has been raised of whether the same strategy might bear the same fruit. If the Democrats were to vociferously oppose everything Trump and his allies tried to accomplish, would voters hand them the Congress? To a large extent, the answer to that question hinges on how Democrats would respond to their party taking such a position. Republicans, after all, are generally seen as more resistant to government. Would Democratic existence uh, uh, be received in the same way? Obstinance, sorry, excuse me. In a, a few years ago, polling indicated that Democrats were much more likely to want to see compromise from their elected leaders than were Republicans. In 2014, two-thirds of Democrats preferred the idea of compromise compared with only four in ten Republicans. So, this article isn't nefarious in any way. It's not, like, completely missing the point. Yes, Republicans have been more stringent to their beliefs in the past, and Democrats have been more willing to compromise during polling. Yes, but why are we still pretending like polling is actually something that's influencing policy? I'm going to quote my own thesis in this own Princeton study, which has been widely reported. Um, 
a 2014 Princeton University study found that, quote, when the preferences of economic elites and the stands of organized interest groups are controlled for, the preferences of the average American appear to only have a minuscule, near-zero, statistically non-significant impact on public policy. But this article is still pretending that the polling is what is swaying the Republicans and the Democrats to doing other things. I'll give you another example. Do you guys remember after San Bernardino how many Americans wanted background checks? In October of 2015, a CBS News New York Times poll found that 92% of Americans, including 87% of Republicans, favor background checks for all gun buyers. And we couldn't even get that through Congress. So why is the Washington Post still pretending like polling is an accurate indication of what Congress is going to do? I don't really understand it. And then it ends, the, it gives a bunch of statistics and talks about the correlation between partisanship and unwillingness to compromise and what, Amer what voters want. Pew data shows that voters who are more skeptical of the opposition are more likely to oppose compromise. No shit, of course. But what's more important is if the, if the Democrats and the Republicans are actually listening to the polling. Republicans certainly don't give a damn about polling. And they're supposed to be a representative democracy, yet we're con continuing to play politics as, as usual. And they, the Washington Post shows a graph that shows trust in government by Republicans and Democrats. And they say, oh, it kind of goes with the flow every single time. When a Republican's in office, the Republicans are more trusting of the government. When Obama's in office, Democrats are more trusting of the government. But it doesn't show, doesn't show that overall trust in government has gone down. So we're still playing politics as usual, despite the fact that we, politics are clearly very unusual, and we just elected someone who has fascistic tendencies to office who has no political experience whatsoever. The article concludes with, in recent years, as evidenced by Bernie Sanders' strong insurgent campaign in the party's primary, Democrats have gotten more willing to say that they're liberal. In 2000, under 30% of Democrats described themselves that way. By last year, that number reached 45%. Democrats, in other words, have grown less moderate. All of which indicates that the decision by the party to dig in its heels wouldn't necessarily be met w with opposition from its base. Of course not! That's what we've been saying for years! That's not the same thing as winning back the government, of course, but one can certainly draw uh, a direct line from the Tea Party insurgency that rippled through the Republican Party at the beginning of Obama's first term uh, to the candidacy and to the election of Trump. Yes, because when Democratic lawmakers are strong, people respond like Bernie Sanders. This entire article ignores money, and they think that it's just about polling. That's what the issue is with the mainstream media. They go, hear no evil, see no evil, and they pretend like, oh, this is, if the Republicans, uh, constituent, if the Republican constituencies polls this way, that's how they're going to go. If the Democratic constituencies poll this way, that's how they're going to go. Sure, that may have a small effect on policy, but as I read, a Princeton study found, a massive Princeton study that spanned over 20 years, found that the preferences of the average Americans have a minuscule, near-zero, statistically non-significant impact on public policy. So why are we still pretending like, pol like, like polling is exactly what's going to be influencing policy? It's the money, and you know who's, what money always trends more towards? Pro-business, pro-corporate conservatives. That's why the Democrats are less likely to have a Tea Party. Because the business interests aren't behind them, if we're wanting them to be more progressive, and if the Tea Party is moving more towards the left, yeah, which is what we would be assuming. But the thing about it as well is that when you have a system that favors one party being stronger and being more obstructionist because the money is behind them, then the, the personalities of the people that are in those parties are, are different. So the Republicans are strong, strident, firm, that's a good way of putting it, stubborn, pro-corporatist. And the Democrats are going to play ball with the corporate interests. That's because they get picked. 
if they were Bernie Sanders, if they were progressive, if all of them were, were the people's choice, then the money wouldn't get behind them, you know? So that's what makes the small differences in Washington. And that's what outlets like the Washington Post don't get.